Well, my name is Phil Dalton. Uh, in addition to being a professor of rhetoric and uh, I am a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy. I'm also the director of the Center for Civic Engagement here at Hofstra. Today is an important day for the Center of Civic Engagement. My understanding is that the Day of Dialogue is a big reason that the center exists today. And we set this day aside every year to host events that foster discussion between students, faculty, and community members. And some of the reason is to deliberate about issues that we can know the issues better and interrogate others' claims and solutions. And another reason, however, is one that could not be more important than it is right now, and that is to provide experiences and models for disagreement that keeps the community's focus on the issue while affirming respect for others in the community. And that's just another way of saying we hope to model enlightened civility with these events. We start the day by getting right to the heart of things with this session, examining the state of our democracy. Surveying public communication today, it may seem like arguments about policies, is, that's a luxury. Why? Because the very apparatus designed to correct problems, democratic discussion, and give citizens influence in that process is being compromised. Today's events couldn't have been possible without the help of numerous people. Our moderator and panelists who will be introduced shortly are members of the advisory board of the Center for Civic Engagement. And the board is comprised of current retired faculty members as well as members of the, of the community. And nearly every member of that board contributed in some way to today's events. We also benefit in various ways from the support of the office of Provost Herman Berliner. And logistically, we must thank the Office of University Relations and specifically the executive director of the Hofstra Cultural Center, Athleen Collins. And she's devoted countless hours to helping us learn how to take these events and stream them as well as collect all the RSVP, RSVPs and various other forms of administrivia. And finally, and perhaps most important, the Center for Civic Engagement is indebted to our undergraduate fellows and to our graduate assistant for civic literacy and on-campus events, Callie Wynn. And to all of you, I extend my thanks. But now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Professor of Global Studies and Geography, Linda Longmire. And just before I do hand it over, I ask you to look at a link that I'll put in the chat in a moment. And this is a link to other events held throughout the day. And if something looks interesting to you, RSVP for it and join us. Also <laughs> invite a friend or a neighbor and now with all my thanks out of the way, I introduce to you Professor Longmire. Linda. Hi, Phil. Thank you so much. This is such an exciting day where we not only think about civic literacy, but hopefully practice uh, political fitness as well. Uh, it's so important to talk about these urgent issues. Has there ever been a more critical time to, uh, to save democracy, many would argue. But um, what we really hope is also that from this will come a kind of civic activism as well. Um, we don't need to tell anyone how important it is to vote, vote, vote. Not three times, you only get to vote once, but nonetheless, make sure that you vote. That's part of our civic responsibility, our civic duty, but also it's what it means to be a human being in these challenging times. So I'm really grateful that we're having this initial panel where we talk about the state of democracy and uh, I'm really delighted that we have three of our most articulate colleagues. I said earlier, it's a little bit cruel to have three such articulate faculty members analyzing the state of democracy when we only have uh, so few minutes, but, um, but hopefully we'll provide opportunity as well for students and other participants to weigh in and to, uh, to share in our collective deliberations on the state of democracy today. So each of them will speak for about eight to 10 minutes and then we'll open things up, your comments, questions, insights, um, lamentations, whatever. But uh, I also just wanna add my thanks to Phil and Fellows uh, particularly, and of course to Athlean at the Cultural Center. This is a, a collective activity always. You need a community to make things uh, happen and we're blessed to have such a great community. In any case, I first want to turn things over to my dear friend and colleague, David Green, who will speak first. Uh, David is a professor in the um, political science department. And again, we're so grateful that we have 
three such heavy hitters uh, for our panelists today because we've never needed vision analysis um, uh, and, uh, and energy and activation more. So David, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, Dave will speak for about eight to 10 minutes and then we'll move on. Thank you. And uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you, students included, and especially my friends and colleagues on the panel. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to ask you guys in advance to forgive me for speaking rapidly. I have a lot to say, and as Linda indicated, only 10 minutes to do it. So forgive me for that. I suppose it's an occupational hazard. We professors talk too much, but there's a lot I want to cover. So the question before us today concerns the state of American democracy. And I want to try to address that question by dividing the temporal dimension into three basic locations. That is sort of before Trump, during Trump, and after Trump. And to be clear, I'm using Trump here as a stand-in for nearly the entirety of the Republican Party, which is itself a stand-in for some 35 or 40 percent of the country. That is to say, it's a mistake, I think, to believe, as some people do, that Trump came out of nowhere. We've actually been building toward this moment for half a century. So let me start by loosely defining democracy as a system of government in which people govern themselves. And that can be done directly through ballot initiatives. <laughs> or it can be done indirectly through elected representatives. But at the end of the day, there are at least two acid tests to determine the degree to which any given polity is a true democracy. First and most fundamentally is policy made, excuse me, if policy is made by actors who are neither the public nor are chosen and also removable by the public, then you don't live in a democracy. And second, to the extent that some voters are privileged with more political power than others, to that extent, you also don't live in a democracy. So by these criteria, which I would argue are axiomatic and indisputable definitions of democracy, American democracy was significantly broken well before Donald Trump arrived. There are three branches of American government, and all three of them are powerfully biased toward rural voters and thus toward the conservative ideology and thus toward the Republican Party. That bias can be most easily seen in the Senate. Senators represent entire states, which range in population from Wyoming's 579,000 people to California's nearly 40 million. And right away, you can see a major problem here for the notion of democracy. If I live in Wyoming, I have over 68 times the representation per person, and therefore over 68 times the political power as a person living in California. And there's another way to put this that makes the point more simply and more powerfully. Because of the state's equal representation in the Senate, regardless of population, right now a majority of votes in the Senate is made up by senators representing just 18% of the population. Think about that again. A majority of the Senate represents 18% of the American population. Needless to say, that also means that the remaining 82% of the country has less votes in the Senate than this 18%. And as I've mentioned, that 18% is overwhelmingly rural and therefore overwhelmingly conservative and therefore overwhelmingly Republican. If we turn to the House, we see a similar scenario, but here um, we have districts that are relatively equal in population, but they're not naturally made. They're made by humans. Those lines are drawn by humans, which, draws, which brings us to the um, concept of gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the term to describe the creation of sort of bizarrely shaped district boundaries that have been drawn by one party in order to give advantage to that party. And it's very powerful if it's abused, and it, and it has been in the last 10 years in particular. Pennsylvania has 18 seats in the House, and because of extreme gerrymandering by the Republican Party there, third, so the, if you look at the vote now, uh, sorry, uh, statewide in, in Pennsylvania, you see about even in the last several elections, about even vote for uh, Republicans and Democrats. But because of gerrymandering, um, Republicans have got 13 out of the 18 seats in the last uh, three elections prior to the previous one. So what that means is that 50 percent of Pennsylvanians are voting Democratic for, for Democrats to go to the House, but they are getting less than 28 percent of the state seats effectively cutting their voting power and thus their representation in half. If we turn to the presidency, here the effect, the effect is also more muted than in the Senate, but it's still important. Remember that the president, presidents are not chosen by the popular vote. As we all know right now, they're chosen by the Electoral College. And the formula for ca calculating electoral votes per state is one vote for each senator and representative in Congress. And since the number of senators does not vary by population, that gives a mathematical advantage, once again, to small rural conservative states. Sorry. Um, 
So as we've already noted, um, these states are more conservative leaning, as I mentioned, not so much liberal. <laughs> and the question is, does this mathematical advantage matter? Yes, an electoral um, majority might uh, it, it um, might not be enough for Democrats to win in uh, present elections. 538, which is a um, polling and analytical group, um, has calculated that uh, for if Joe Biden wins, say, 3% more of the national vote um, than Donald Trump, he doesn't necessarily win the presidency. In fact, in order to um, have a secure lock on the presidency, he would need to win by 6% more than Donald Trump. We also know that Republicans have won the popular vote for president for the presidency only once in the last 20 years, and yet they have controlled the presidency for 12 of those 20 years. Finally, if you turn to the third branch of government, the federal judiciary, which more and more of these days is where policy is made, based on the work we've already done, we can see it's easy to figure out what's going on there. The justices of the Supreme Court and the other two levels of the federal judiciary are all chosen by the same process. The president nominates, the Senate confirms. So consider what we already know. The president is the presidency is biased towards conservatism. The Senate is heavily biased towards conservatism. And these are the institutional actors who are choosing the justices. How will they choose? Of course, that question sort of answers itself. If you put it all together, then what we see is that all four of America's key policymaking institutions, House, Senate, presidency, and the courts, have a conservative bias to them. And partly, this is the product of kind of coincidental and inner, inner, inadvertent uh, demographic tendencies, ideology, and, and so on. But partly, it's also the product of efforts by conservatives to tilt the system in their favor. Finally, what I should note here is that there's been a general movement in American government to move policymaking power away from the democratic branches of government, that's Congress and the presidency, and invest it in the non-democratic branch, that's the judiciary. And given our definition of democracy, that makes little sense, and it's not what the founders intended. The reason that conservatives are anxious to make policy in the courts rather than in the elected branches is because their policy positions are almost entirely contrary to those of the American people. If you look at the polling data, thank you, on issue after issue, whether it's guns or gay marriage or abortion or climate change or health care or taxes or civil rights, or the pandemic, the polling data shows over and over again that the public favors the liberal position on those questions. And this reveals the essence of America's lack of democracy, according to the definition that we started with. Um, the citizens are not governing, but non-elected and non-removable judges with lifetime appointments are doing so instead. So I can see I'm already running out of time. I wanted to talk about the era during Trump. All I can say about Trump in like 30 seconds is that um, he has continually shattered norm after norm. And again, I would include Republicans in this, particularly Mitch McConnell. Um, whether it comes to using foreign policy in the State Department for his political ends, whether it comes to using the criminal justice system for the same purpose, whether it comes to even delaying the post office and the delivery of mail, whether it comes to suppressing the vote, um, the, the, you just see this incredible um, shattering of, of democratic norms over and over again. Uh, I wish I had more time to speak to that, but maybe we can come back to that. I'll, I'll just now turn to the future. We have an election in a week. I am deeply concerned about um, uh, what happens if Trump wins, and I'm deeply concerned about what happens if Trump loses. If Trump wins, that gives him four more years of the presidency, and I don't know that the 250-year American experiment in, in democratic self-rule can survive that. If Trump loses, it's inconceivable to me that he would do the thing that every other candidate does on election night when they lose, which is to make a phone call to the winner and congratulate them and, and then go out before the public and concede the race. I don't think it's possible that he would do that. So the question then becomes, does he try to hold on to office? And if he does try to hold on to office, even though he lost the election, who tries to remove him? Who would be in charge of removing? We don't know. Would it be the Army? Would it be the FBI? Would it be the Secret Service? We've never been here before. We don't know. And then the other question is, um, would they do it, whoever that is? Um, and over and over and over again during the last four years, we've seen institutional actors fail and put their career and put the Republican Party ahead of American democracy. So I'm very dubious about whether they would actually be willing to do that. And then I guess finally, does Trump mobilize the 35 to 40 percent of his supporters to come out on the street with guns and essentially um, create a civil war type scenario in America because he refuses to concede that he lost the election? 
So I'm not sure which to be more afraid of, that Trump wins the election on Tuesday or that he loses the election on Tuesday. But the state of our democracy, I guess some, I would say, is very unhealthy for all the reasons that I mentioned. We used to be sort of the pride of, um, of the world, a, a country that um, others admired for the quality of our democracy, and I doubt that happens very much anymore today. You know, sorry to end with that sad note, but that's how I see the state of American democracy. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, and you were to the second, so I really appreciate your timeliness. It was- uh, It was hard, let me tell you, I, I left out a lot. I know. I know, but it was a brilliant kind of haiku version of- Thank you, haiku, good. <laughs> So I uh, really appreciate it. And again, sometimes we need to have that sort of clear-headed pessimism. This is a moment that calls for that in order to then move forward to know how to, uh, how to act. So I'm going to call it realism, Linda, but you can label it however you like. I always go back to Gramsci. We have to cultivate pessimism of the mind and optimism of the will. So uh, I think uh, whether, whatever we call it, it's that combination that is is called on today, I think. Thank you so much, David. On to Mike DiNocenzo, who everyone knows. I think Mike has been here longer than any, any other person and has garnered wisdom along the way. And uh, so we're so grateful, as always, for, uh, for Mike's participation uh, as a history professor and uh, as a longtime political activist. I think, I think Mike is the only person who's actually walked the talk and run for office. So uh, we're grateful for, for all of that wisdom and all of that action. Mike, what do you think about the state of democracy today? Is it better to have run and lost than never to have run at all? <laughs> anyway, I won't elaborate on that. O only uh, you will tell. <laughs> uh, thank you, David, as usual, for an excellent uh, beginning. And thanks to CCE for fostering these communities of discourse that take us back to the founding of our nation when we had communities of discourse, when the people were celebrated as the constituent power. And that's the ongoing challenge, I think, for our democracy. We've had a lot of challenges throughout our history. Democracy depends on attentive citizens who will seek reliable knowledge to make informed judgments. That's not an easy uh, thing to do. And I celebrate historians. I've had a lot of great teachers lawyers and journalists, because one of the things that they share that's critical to our democracy is looking for evidence and looking for credible witnesses. So how do we as citizens, and I invite the students, everyone participating to think about your questions or responses to two examples I wanna give. I only have time for two examples of how we try to engage citizens and communities of discourse so we can find a better way forward, as Tom Paine said, to begin the world anew. No other nation came into existence the way the United States did at the time of the revolution. Jill Lepore has written a great book uh, called These Truths that go back to those founding principles. In any event, uh, what I wanna do is give two examples of the uses of evidence and credible witnesses and ask you to consider how you would assess them. The first one is from history. And this one is by uh, Theodore Dwight Weld. If you've never heard of Theodore Dwight Weld, W-E-L-D, Google him. He is one of the most amazing people in American history who have seldom been uh, discussed. And he was amazing because he's married to an, an amazing woman, Angelina Grimke. Mm. And together they wrote one of the most significant books in all of American history that few people have heard of. And the book was called A History of American Slavery, Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses. And when people then, and this was before Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was in 1839. And what they said was that people who doubt how bad slavery it is, we're gonna bring you the evidence. We're gonna bring you the witnesses. And they went into the South, they read Southern newspapers, Southern diaries, Southern journals, comments by Southern people, and they indicted slavery and the Southern slave owners by their own words. Testimony of a thousand witnesses. What happened? The Southerners began to censor the mails, censor the publications. They did not want the First Amendment to uh, bring forth 
that kind of information. So Theodore Dwight Weld provides us with an early example of seeking uh, evidence and seeking credible witnesses. Well, where does that bring us today? It brings us among other places to the Lincoln Project. And if, you, if you've never looked at the Lincoln Project, Google it. The Lincoln Project was established by a group of lifelong Republicans and conservatives. It's got to be read to be appreciated. And in their, on their website, they say, and I'm quoting, and we invite your comments as well. They say on their website, Trump, uh, Trump is a failed president. But don't take our word for it. Just listen to the people who worked for him. And they cite dozens of people, including retired, uh, retired uh, General John Kelly, who says, and again, I'm quoting, that uh, Trump is the most flawed person I have ever known. The depths of his dishonesty are just astounding. And the list goes on, sort of like Theodore Dwight Weld. The list of the witnesses, the list of the witnesses. Michael Steele, the former head of the Republican Party, is one of many people who's now not only publicly denounced Trump, but he says he's voting for, uh, for Biden. So is the governor of Ohio, who spoke at the Democratic Convention. What do you make of those witnesses? What do you conclude from that? And there are two other examples from the Theodore Dwight Weld approach to looking for evidence and witnesses that you can pursue. I don't have time to go into all of them. On October 18th, the New York Times uh, Sunday Review had a full page, and the page was entitled, Fit for Office. And uh, the subtitle was, uh, what some of the, uh, of the men and women who have been closest to the president have to say about him. Again, what do you make of that evidence? What do you make of those witnesses? And, and uh, another comment, and then I'll have one last one, is that that same night on short notice, uh, CNN had a special program. Again, you could probably Google and get it. And the program was called The Insiders, a warning from from President Trump's officials. Well, all of this, one would think maybe these people have been reading Theodore Dwight Weld, testimony of a thousand witnesses. How much, how much does it count and have impact? One of my heroes is William Weld, descended from Theodore Dwight Weld, former Republican governor of Massachusetts, who in, 19, who in 2016 said, the country is in for a bad time if it elects Donald Trump because he has been, and I quote William Weld, a lifelong huckster. So how, what do you make of that evidence? What do you make of those witnesses? Great. Mike, I've never heard you be so timely. That is so wonderful. Thank you. Not only timely, but wise as predicted. So glad you mentioned William Weld also, because some students in the audience may remember when, um, when David Green brought his uh, a whole group of faculty and students to busloads to the New Hampshire primary. One of, the, one of the briefings was with William Weld and it was so superb and I think really had an impact. So thank you for, for all of that um, information about bearing witness, the importance of bearing witness in a democracy. Thank you so much, Mike, I really appreciate Appreciate your timeliness. I didn't even need to use my two minute marker. So, um, uh, and, and finally, I'm so delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Carolyn Eisenberg. Many of you know her as Rusty Eisenberg, and we are so grateful that she's going to provide us not only with the critique, but I think a, a broader view of this historical moment as well. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much, Rusty, for. Um, for being here, for speaking truth to power as you always do and uh, for speaking to us. Thank you, Linda. Uh, first, I wanna make sure, can people hear me? Yes, okay, that's good. I mean, I, I'm now intimidated by the fact that David and Mike managed to stay in their time frame. <laughs> so it's, it's a high standard or whatever. Um, I, I wanna um, shift gears for a minute and speak about 
two presidents, two previous presidents whose policies I actually didn't agree with. Harry Truman, Democrat, and Richard Nixon, Republican. Um, and for two of my book projects, I spent considerable amount of time, you know, in archives looking at their declassified records. Um, so that took a lot of time and learned a lot of interesting things. Truman became president in, 19, in April 1945, close to the beginning of Roosevelt's fourth term. And unfortunately for him, Roosevelt had never included him in any foreign policy discussions. But there was, there he was, he's president and the wars in Europe and Asia were not quite over. There were complicated post-war relations with allies that had to be navigated. And unfortunately for him, there was a major conference that had been scheduled in Potsdam, Germany. And that conference was going to be Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin. And now suddenly Harry Truman who knew almost nothing about foreign policy had to take that responsibility. And so that was very intimidating. Um, but in preparation for this event, the State Department prepared exceptionally detailed briefing books on everything. And I remember when I looked at those briefing books, I thought, you know, my God, a 10 year old could now negotiate for the United States. So very complicated briefing books. And Truman was a little cranky about it because there's a lot of things to read. Um, and he complained to his wife that this was so much. However, it was his job. And on, his, on the boat to Potsdam, he carefully reviewed the material that his experts had put together. So now I'm gonna to jump to Richard Nixon. Um, unlike, and no, I'm not a Nixon, you know, frustrated Nixon uh, admirer, but unlike Truman, he knew a lot about foreign policy before he, assuming office. But nevertheless, as issues kept evolving, he would take hours familiarizing himself with the relevant documents. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because you see these memos that are like single spaced, 14 pages prepared by the staff people. And you see Nixon is writing little questions and little comments, you know, all along the margins. So he did that normally. And just one example of that is that prior to the Moscow summit in the spring of 1972, he asked Henry Kissinger to estimate how many days and hours he would be negotiating with the Russian leader Brezhnev. Uh, well, I had long breaks between sessions here. And Kissinger says, no, probably not. Um, so like Truman, he gets briefing books, but now years have passed by and his, those briefing books are even fatter than the ones that Truman had together. So Nixon looked at that and he says, well, you know what, Henry, I better be totally prepared before we leave. So maybe I should go to Florida and read those, that, that material before we even meet, which he did. Now, as I indicated, I like to glorify these people. Truman and Richard Nixon made many policy decisions that I would disagree with, many of you might disagree with, but I'm telling these stories for a particular reason. Be, be, because for these two presidents and for every person who has ever occupied the White House, there's something awesome and humbling about being president of the United States. And you know that with this position comes an obligation to work hard at your job, to master relevant materials, to listen to expert opinion, and at least in public, be respectful of all segments of the population because in fact, you are the single most powerful person in the world. As many of you know, when Nixon's tapes became available, it turned out that when he was talking to close aides, um, he could use foul language and he complained bitterly about his enemies and many of you know he compiled the secret enemies list. However, when Richard Nixon was in public, he understood his responsibility as chief executive was to conduct himself in a dignified way and to be respectful of every person he encountered which is a very long way of saying, in a way, something that the previous speakers are talking about, um, is that right now the president we have is fundamentally different from his, from, from his predecessors. We really want to emphasize that. Emphasize that. This is not normal. Um, this is a man who spends much of his time watching television. It's understood he doesn't examine briefing books or memoranda. He doesn't like to read, and he doesn't want anyone talking to him for a long period of time about issues. He has never drawn a line between his businesses and his responsibilities as chief executive. People are being directed to his family hotels 
and his family's making millions because of the misuse of the presidential office. He uses his podium in the White House to call opponents' names. No president's ever done that. And to insult reporters, he doesn't like. The list of different, and that we could be here for another two hours, the list of differences between President Trump and every other individual as who's held this office um, for the past century is profound. This is not a normal presidency. And so now we come to the present, the unbelievable mishandling of the pandemic. Whether or not it came from China, you know, is beside the point. Um, his management of this crisis has set a new bar for incompetence. And that's in plain sight. Columbia researchers just finished a study which showed that our that had our government put in effect the regulations in use in Germany that an estimated 130,000 lives would have been saved. You know, I was actually, just to interrupt for one second, I was actually, this is exactly supposed to be in Vietnam for a conference. Um, and <laughs> if you think about Vietnam, which borders on China, ha Vietnam has almost no cases and almost no death. So, we, a bunch of Americans were invited to come to a conference. And I said, no, you can't come. You don't want Americans bringing in your germs there. So, but the point is that Vietnam has managed to save their own people. And you know, in Europe, we know it's spiking, but nevertheless, if you look at, for example, Germany, they're doing much better than, you know, than, than we are. And what, even if you set aside the consideration of the past, right? Just look at what's going on right now, public, experts are speaking with a single voice about what needs to be done, masks, social distance, testing, contact tracing. And yet the president of the United States openly flaunts those recommendations. And by holding the rallies that he's conducting now, people packed in, no social distancing, making jokes about mask wearers, including his opponent. He's put our country on a path which, if it doesn't change, will result in 300,000 deaths by the time we get to February. We have never seen a situation like this. And we have never seen an American president so indifferent to the loss of life of Americans. We have a lot of presidents who are pretty indifferent um, to what happens to other people. But um, you know, to actually be given these hor hor horrifying figures, to have a country right now which is almost everybody is disorganized. I would imagine that if all the people that are appearing in rectangles, if you ask yourself, what's Thanksgiving like this year? You know, the most minute things. And anyway, why are we in rectangles? But to have in this situation a president that is apparently indifferent to the, all of that is an extraordinary situation. The point of my remarks is not to stop with this description. Because the real question we have to ask ourselves is, we understand that Donald Trump is abnormal. But we have to ask yourself, and I think David is speaking to this and Mike as well, is how do we get to this point? How did this happen? What about our country and this pattern of governance could allow this to occur? Because if you step back and think about it, Donald Trump is not some all-powerful usurper. He's enjoyed the support of congressional Republicans throughout the past four years. 40% of the country approves of his conduct in office. He might even win on election day. So we have to recognize the abnormality, but what do we do there? We have to look deeper. And that's a very challenging question. I'm going to mention it in the next two minutes. Uh, some factors that, um, that David uh, it, you know, didn't have time to touch on. So what, what's happening? How do we get to this place? So I actually had four things, but I'm gonna actually squeeze in a fifth. The fifth thing is we have a lot of angry Americans. And you look at those rallies, you have met, you, you're, the president is in a rage, he feels like he's a victim, he's egging the audience on to act on their anger. So one question is, what is that all about, right? Um, so a second, a second uh, <clears throat> item is a substrate of resentment that many white Americans feel towards black and brown people, to immigrants, to Muslims, to other white people who seem more privileged and elite. These feelings didn't begin with Donald Trump, but they feed his presidency. And he in turn has been a genius at whipping up these, steps, these sentiments. You know, one thing I left out, which I think needs to be said here is that there is, is also the role of conservatism. Among the supporters of Donald Trump, there are people who think he's personally obnoxious, but they're supporting him anyway, because they genuinely believe in a conservative agenda. 
They genuinely believe that lower taxes is better, getting rid of regulation is better, um, getting rid of government agencies that deal with issues of quality is better. I mean, there, there, is, there are principal people in this mix who have a conservative ideology and think nevertheless that Donald Trump is serving their interests. Another factor in this, in this turn that we've experienced is the existence of alternate media like Fox, which actually has Americans living in different realities. Um, I had a student the other day who said, well, you know, it's a good thing that the virus is ending because otherwise uh, Donald Trump would be in trouble. So what's that about? That's about an alternative media that has no regard for actual reality. And we have millions of Americans that are, um, are in that. But then there's a fourth consideration I want to mention, which is a lack of knowledge by millions of people and inattentiveness to politics. And that situation is not just true of the Ozarks, you know, oh, let's go, you know, that's how they run the stuff. They don't know anything. They're not paying attention. Well, that may be true, but there's also plenty of that right here in Long Island, right? Of people not interested, not paying attention. You know, even think of the congressional races going on now, there are two Republican seats that are up. You know, how many people are, are you know, are being contested with very different people, right? Um, you know, with very different people, um, you know, running for, um, for those positions. And you ask yourself, you know, how many people are following that or paying any attention to that? But unfortunately, when people aren't really paying much attention or they're tuning out uh, their nation's <coughs> problems, it's gonna be much easier for a demagogue to gain support and to pursue um, catastrophic policies. I, I, I'm seeing Linda's hit, and I realize this is not the most cheerful talk that you'll hear all day. And actually, this is probably the most uncheerful panel you'll hear all day. But there is a hopeful sign as well, you know. And that's the, you know, as we've seen in this pandemic, that is a, li you know, the literally millions of Americans, people we know, people at Hofstra, who have stepped up in one way or another to really be of help and considerate of their fellow Americans to, you know, whether they're in a hospital, whether they're, you know, EMTs, we have seen so many examples of selflessness on the part of people. We're also seeing, um, you know, the vast number of people that are lining up to vote, right? I mean, suddenly the right to vote has become very important and we're seeing millions of Americans do that. Um, but regardless who wins this election, whether President Trump is retired to private life or he wins, we have grave problems for our um, in our politics and society. And the reality is that how this is all going to get handled is not gonna be done by older people like myself. This is the task of your generation of tuning into politics to understand that what happens in that level is of enormous importance to the lives of people and that you have a role to play and that you can affect change. And that's voting but it also goes beyond voting, thinking about how you can be a proactive citizen. That's really the challenge for today. Great, thank you so much. I'm so awed by both the wisdom and the timeliness of, uh, of our panel, because I know how much more uh, you have to say and to contribute. But we really want to try to maximize participation. And so we wanna open things up to your questions and comments being mindful that uh, yes, crisis is opportunity um, and that democracy requires full on, that is deep democracy at least, requires full on participation. So we, uh, we welcome your questions. I believe Olivia and Alex are going to send me questions in the chat. Is that correct, guys? Okay. Um, I know that uh, there's lots of questions. I know there's one for David. How uh, the questioner says, what? Do we think the response of the Republican Party would be to Trump refusing to leave office, as you indicated, is a real possibility? That's a great question because, you know, Trump is one person. So if he was standing there on an island saying, I'm, I'm still president, I'm still president, and nobody was listening or paying attention or acting accordingly, it would be meaningless. And I like to think that the Republican Party will, um, comply with the express preferences of the American public, but I don't. Um, everything I've seen in the last four years, and here I'm going to depart with my colleague and friend, Professor Eisenberg. Um, I, I, I think that um, Trump is different stylistically, but in two other very important categories, um, ideologically, uh, 
slash programmatically on the one hand, and in terms of the destructiveness to the uh, fabric of American democracy, I don't think he's different. I think he represents sort of the apogee of 40, 50 years of um, the, what the conservative movement has been doing. And so if you look at somebody like Mitch McConnell and the sort of games that have been played to essentially pack the, uh, um, the judicial uh, branch of government, um, and if you look at the voter suppression that's going on, that's rampant all across America in Republican controlled states. And if you look at the discussion that's being held right now to in, in states where um, the voters might choose Joe Biden and therefore in a normal process, all the electors in the electoral college would go to Joe <laughs> Biden, um, but the state legislature is um, controlled by the Republican party. They're talking about subverting the vote of the people in that state and casting the electoral votes from the legislature rather than from the people. If you look at, I mean, you just put it all together and, and, and also you look at the silence that's greeted um, many of the uh, worst uh, acts by Donald Trump over the last four years, um, the, the failure of any uh, figure aside from one or two who've been drummed out of the party like Jeff Flake, uh, the failure of any of them to stand up to Donald Trump and say, you know, no, you cannot say those things. No, you cannot threaten to jail your opponent because you don't like your opponent. No, you cannot threaten violence against people. No, you cannot, um, uh, you know, say nice things about um, these goon squads, these neo-Nazis who are running around um, conducting violence against the American public. Um, nobody speaks up against that. So to answer the question, um, do I have faith that Republicans would do the right thing if Donald Trump clearly loses the election? No, I don't. And I don't have faith in the public either, uh, that, that the 35 to 40 percent, I view them Honestly, it pains me to say this. I mean, I hope nobody thinks that I take delight in any of this. I don't. Um, but I view that 35 to 40 percent as essentially a kind of massive political cult in America today who have suspended their rational faculties and have suspended disbelief. And they are following a con man and they get emotional gratification from doing that. And so they don't think rationally. And as uh, Rusty was mentioning, they they don't have accurate news sources either, so they don't have accurate information. And so I neither uh, trust um, the elites, say in Congress in the Republican Party, nor the Republican base to respect democracy in this election. And I'm deeply fearful what's, uh, of what's going to happen if Trump loses the election but refuses to concede that he lost the election, both of which I think is, are very likely events uh, on Tuesday and the days following. Rusty, did you want to yeah, I, I want to uh, come in real quickly about that. I mean, I don't disagree with um, David's point that there that these trends have been building for a long time, that, you know, there are a variety of political abuses that didn't just start with Donald Trump. But where I actually really disagree with him is I think that you have a president right now who is actually behaving in qualitatively different ways from other chief executives. So it's not like he woke up uniquely evil but you know, lots of things enabled it. But I actually think it's pretty important to take into account how different he is on so many different levels um, than his predecessors. So, I mean, I think that is a substantive disagreement. You know, just one, like to take the most trivial example, when there are disasters in the country, you know, that there's a hurricane, there are fires, there are, you know, whatever, you know, people are getting sick, whatever the particular disasters, American presidents go to those places. And those are easy photo ops, right? You're American president, you sympathize with people in your country, you go there to express your concern. I mean, that's like being president, you know, class 101 to do all those things. It's stunning that we have a president who isn't doing that. And again, I'm not just like picking a little itty bitty personal trait. It's that these things are really different. I think it's important for us to understand that there really is a significant difference. Can I just, just quickly respond to that? So I, you know, again, stylistically, I think he is completely different from his predecessors, um, but not in those other domains, which I think are more important. And then I guess the other thing I would ask is, um, where is the Republican Party? Are they are they sitting there looking at Trump? And, and by that, I mean the elites in Congress and the base. And are they sitting there looking at Trump and saying, wow, this guy is so different. He's so bad. No, they ha it has become the Trump Party. 
Um, so he's in exactly the same place they are. Or they're in exactly the same place he is. So maybe he's different from his predecessors stylistically, but he's he's very representative of the party today, I would say. Let's go on to another question. Um, this one is about the role of the media that was mentioned, um, that uh, given you know how important the role of the media is and how the role that Fox News has played uh, in hypnotizing people, um, that's not what the question said, but uh, uh, what, what do you think and how important is it uh, to, even if Trump loses, how important is it to change the role of the media, particularly when you're talking about something like Fox News. Mike, did you want to speak yeah, to that? Thanks, Linda. Uh, may I recommend to everyone an article in the Washington Post on October 13th on this topic by a lifelong conservative, Max Boot, B-O-O-T, who has spoken at Hofstra. And his article talks about some of the points that David and Rusty have made about the extent of disinformation and misinformation in America. And Boot raises a number of points. I don't, I'm not gonna take the time to elaborate, but it is one of the most powerful assessments I've read anywhere, October 13th in the Washington Post. And a major point he makes is that that disinformation and misinformation will continue among Trump supporters, even if Trump loses. Consequently, how do we go on and address the many people who Boot says have believed Trump's nonstop lies, which, which Chief of Staff John Kelly said, do people support Trump believe that he doesn't lie? If you think he lies, then how do we assess, says Boot, the 42% of the American public who are still supporting, according to Boot, the worst president of our time and in all of American history. Yes, I think so. All of you have referenced the conditions that led to Trump uh, and the, the ways in which other factors have sort of set the table for Trump and that it, the problem, the issues are much bigger than, than simply, yes, this absolutely unique, uh, uniquely distressing president, but that it's a much broader, much broader question. Um, another one, What's the simplest policy that we could enact that would increase the integrity for our democracy? Sort of moving on to what can be done. Um, any ideas, suggestions? Perhaps there's no simple policy, but um, what would be a first thing that people could focus on? Uh, is it the role of the media? That's certainly part of it. Uh, is it some way of protecting the, the process? Is it re a restructuring task that, um, that David was implying about how we elect our representatives um, and the, the lack of fairness of that, the lack of real representative democracy. Any wisdom on this, Mike? Yeah, so even the Wall Street Journal, which reportorially is usually quite good, and the reporters have criticized the editorial and op-ed uh, groups for being distortive. The Wall Street Journal points out and the former editor Baker says Trump could lose because of his personal character alone, that people have so much Trump fatigue and anger. And I think Biden is making the point now and saying, you know me. And I, the question is, you, you begin by saying, do you have a candidate and a leader of some integrity that you can believe? Uh, and, and Biden is smart, I think, in trying to say he's taking the Obama line. It's not the red states. It's not the blue states. It's the United States. As I travel around Long Island, which Trump says he's going to win overwhelmingly, I don't think that's going to be the case. People are saying they want to find ways of the country come together. Which candidate, which president will try to foster that? A follow up from Robert Ford's very good question about, for example, what about some of the structural issues, ranked choice voting, changes to campaign financing, the abolishment of the electoral college. David, do you want to speak to that? Are there any, there's, there's perhaps no one specific policy, but uh, perhaps a cluster of structural changes. I'm shaking my head because there's so much work to be done. Um, all those things that you mentioned, the electoral college is profoundly undemocratic. Um, 
so much work to be done in basic civics education, so much work to be done with all this false media that we have. But I guess if I could point to only one thing, it's something that I think most people are not recognizing at all. And that is, um, there's this concept in, in law and government called judicial review. This is the power that courts have to effectively legislate, to effectively make policy, right? And if you look across the democracies of the world, I don't think you'll find any other country in the world that comes even close to the United States in, in terms of the amount of legislative power that's invested in the courts. And remember, the reason this is really important is because the courts are a non-democratic institution. Nobody gets to pick them. No voter gets to pick them, and they have lifetime appointments, so nobody can vote them out of office if they're dissatisfied with them. So if you have policy being made by non, a non-democratic institution, you don't live in a democracy. I want to emphasize that point. And if you look at American policy, whether it's on abortion or whether it's on gay marriage or whether it's on labor law or whether it's on guns or issue ar area after issue area being made increasingly by the courts. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that, again, represents a conservative agenda to try to do unpopular policy in a way that you can't do it if you do it through democratic means. So if I could only pick one thing, I would, I would try to uh, return the country to what I think was clearly the original vision of the founders, that Congress would be the preeminent branch of government, that Congress would be the legislative branch of government and would actually legislate. So policy in America over and over and over again should be made by Congress and the president, the two political branches, the two democratic branches, not by a non-democratic branch. And therefore, people would have the ability, maybe it would take them two years, maybe it would take them four years, but if they don't like the policy in America, they would have the ability to replace the policymakers with somebody more to their liking. And that, I think, would go a, a huge distance towards solving the problem. But campaign finance reform, the Electoral College, all these things, they're, they're huge. Civics education, they're huge, and we have to do all these things. Great. Rusty, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I just want would add, I mean, I think that, you know, all the, there's all kinds of structural changes that, you know, would be very useful. But the reality is that to the extent that we still do have a democracy and people are given the opportunity to vote, uh, people here on Long Island have a say and ability to decide who's going to be in Congress and what point of view they want represented. And I think we talk about structural changes, you know, endlessly, but the reality is we need to somehow address what is happening in our society that has millions and millions of people, many of whom are very decent, lovely people, you know, standing up and cheering for a white supremacist, accepting, you know, immigrant children being put in cages. I mean, they, I don't think that this is a matter, and I'm not a political scientist, so that's probably why, that you know you could you could rearrange the furniture, but if we don't deal with what the underlying sentiment of our public is, then I don't think those structural changes are going to really amount to that much. Or maybe it's not an either or, but a both and. Okay. Maybe structural changes, but as as you've all pointed out, that it has to be both the transformation of political culture and political consciousness, but also that leading to some definitive improvements in the the structures of democracy. I um, wanted to go back, another question for, for you, Rusty, um, because you mentioned the, the handling of the Linda, COVID. I'm so, sorry to interrupt, but we do need to, to wrap up for the next session. Okay. Sorry. So should we just do this one last question, Phil? Or we, is to, it now? we should wrap up now. Okay. Okay, great. So sorry again for, uh, for the, the time boundaries, but I hope that this wonderful panel uh, has given people a sense of the broad issues and the crisis that we're all facing in terms of the state of democracy. So many other issues flow from these understandings about what is democracy, what's happening to it, and most of all, what can we do about that? I guess the most important way to conclude is simply to say, you know, we all know democracy is not a spectator sport. It's a use it or lose it kind of process, however much we might disagree about what it actually means. So again, I think all we can do is end with uh, not only vote, 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 but do those other things that would deepen full on public participation and encourage the kind of political fitness that can change, hopefully, that can maybe save our uh, body politic. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us. We have a wonderful day ahead of us. 
So uh, go to the go to the links that give the whole agenda of uh, of events, including I want to just put in a plug tonight for 30. Margaret Engel has written a play about human trafficking. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, to conclude with that today. But again, thanks to our wonderful participants. Thanks to Athleen. Thanks to Phil and Fellows and uh, and enjoy the day. Perhaps it's a first step towards, again, energizing our own democracy. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.